All right. Welcome to another episode of Go To Market Mavericks, uh, the podcast about go to market innovators, risk takers, and leaders, and the unique strategies, tactics, and playbooks they and their teams use to succeed. On with me today as our guest is Michael Sharp, who leads the North American commercial SB and net new sales teams at Pluralsight, a leading workplace education SaaS company that offers courses on coding, design, and more making it easier for anyone to get a, get better at their job and grow in their career. Prior to his current role as a senior vice president of sales, Michael did tours of duty across sales development and other go-to market functions, including net new, renewal, and expansion sales. Through his unique and broad set of, of experiences, he's picked up an abundance of firsthand knowledge around what it takes to win as both a salesperson and a sales leader in today's fast-paced and ever-changing landscape. Michael. Excited to have you on. Yeah, thanks, Matson. Thanks for that glowing intro. I appreciate it. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, you got a really broad set of interesting experiences, and so I'm really excited to talk to you today about some of the, the knowledge you can impart with our audience today. Um, yeah. But before we dive in, would you mind just you know, giving me a little bit of backstory uh, on how you got your start in sales and go-to-market, uh, as well as you know, how you've landed where you're at today? Um, might also be interesting to you know understand like the go-to market motion you're running over there uh, at Plural Site, um, general order structure, anything that can help us understand uh, your you know, your past and current context. Um, in short, yeah, absolutely. I'll give you a, a quick bio here. Um, like you mentioned, I started my career as an SDR. Um, the role was actually called marketing associate, so I didn't technically know that I'd be banging the phones and cold calling down a list, but. Um, I consider myself lucky uh, that I fell into that into that job. Um, it was at a company called the Corporate Executive Board, CEB, which was eventually acquired by Gartner. And we were cold calling like C-level executives at Fortune 500 companies. And so I was kind of immediately thrown into the deep end of like, wow, how do you talk to, engage, and interest a really senior executive at a big company? Um, quite, quite an interesting place to learn how to cold call. Um, and while I was there, I kind of fell in love with the sales. I had an incredible mentor, uh, Matthew Gus, who was a top salesperson. And I saw like what, um, what a career in sales could look like, uh, and it was inspiring to me. I, uh, when I was in SDR, I was like, I want to do that. So, um, you know, after being successful as an SDR, I moved into a ton of different account executive account manager roles, um, net new, uh, renewals, growth and expansion, key accounts, um, uh, before moving into various manager roles. One of the cool things about CEB is um, we wrote research on like management best practice and we sold research to heads of sales and to heads of marketing. So I was talking to these exec executives about like modern go to market best practices. And again, like if you're in sales and you're talking to the heads of sales who are at the top of their game about modern sales best practices, it's kind of hard not to fall in love with like innovative sales approaches. Um, yeah, and, and from there, um, you know, I, Gartner acquired CEB, um, you know, we, uh, you know, had quite a run there. Uh, a lot of folks know us because we wrote like the challenger sale research. Um, it was an amazing run. Uh, but then Pluralsight came along and it was an opportunity to move into like proper SaaS. Um, it was an opportunity to work with SMB organizations, build more of like a machine, right. In a high, more highly transactional kind of sales motion. Um, and so, yeah, I thought it was an incredible opportunity in a company with an incredible mission around helping individuals like improve their skill sets and progress in their careers. And so uh, it was an easy decision to move over to Plural Site. No, I, I, uh, I love that journey. Uh, you're right. Starting straight out of the gate with cold calling into CXOs is uh, not for the faint of heart. Um, any uh, wisdom that you can maybe impart to maybe some of our uh, more junior early stage listeners uh, to the podcast uh, on best practices around how to cold call, especially into like those those senior level roles or things that you've seen either firsthand or teams you've managed since. Yeah, absolutely. <clears throat> um, and this may not be like groundbreaking, um, but at the end of the day, it all comes back to crafting an authentic message based on very real research and prep. Um, there are a bunch of incredible tools that exist out there, which are, which are very, very helpful. Um, but I think they should all be helpful in service of crafting that very well-informed, thoughtful message. Um, the reality is any CXO that you're selling to 
um, you know, is working on behalf of the vision and the goals that the CEO has set forth for that organization. Their function that they manage has a critical role in bringing that vision uh, to life or helping the business achieve that particular target. And so thinking just critically around like, well, what is the CEO? What is the vision for the business the CEO has laid out? Um, and even if it's not a publicly traded company, you probably find that just on their website and their aspirations. And then again, like I said, applying some critical thinking to be like, okay, like what is this function that I'm selling to? What is their role probably in bringing this vision to life? And I think building that thoughtful hypothesis uh, and then around what challenges they may be facing in pursuit of that is a great way to start. Got it. Got it. And one of the challenges, right, of being earlier in your career mm -hmm. uh, and being tasked with getting into senior VPs, CXOs at, uh, you know, larger SAS, you know, larger companies, um, whether mm -hmm. it be SaaS or otherwise, is that you don't have a lot of the business context, right? You're yeah. early. You're still learning what it means to, like, to, to run a business and to be part of a business. And the, the priorities, may, what may come second nature to myself and me and you at this stage of our careers uh, may not come as naturally in terms of tying the you know, priorities to your value prop. What are some um, suggestions that you'd give early stage um, you know, aspiring you know, sales reps uh, in terms of just like learning like business? Yeah, that's a great question. Like business acumen, um, you know, we use that phrase a lot and it's so important and so valuable for like a modern seller today to have business acumen. Like where do you go to get that? Um, and you're right. Like a lot of it does come with experience, with hearing executives in like really listening to executives and prospects talk about their business and their strategies. And over time you will, you know, accumulate business acumen, but that, that doesn't help you today. Like if you're earlier in career. So I would leverage a lot of the tools and resources at your disposal. We are so fortunate today that we have like a lot of AI tools that can help connect our company's value proposition to any company's um, industry or even that unique business and what that company has said, you know, out there in the media about about their organization. I mean, that's a great place to start. Um, I found a lot of organizations, their CEOs will speak at, you know, at various events, or conferences, finding those um, presentations or those talks on YouTube is another great place to try to understand, like, what language is this company using? What are they trying to pursue? And then I wouldn't um, hesitate, like m most organizations, you're not selling alone, right? Like you have leaders that are more than happy to help you craft a message early on. Um, it's funny as a sales leader, like we tend to get pulled in at the end of a sales process as if we have some magical closing one, right? Uh, <laughs> but oftentimes earlier on is where we can be most helpful shaping that sales process. If a rep came to me and was like, hey, can you proof this message, here's the research I did on the company. Not sure if this is like the issue you'd hypothesize. They'd have. I'd love to take a crack at reviewing that email uh, and making sure it, it like resonates with what that company is likely thinking about. Um, it could be your sales leader, it could be your frontline manager. And if you're a part of a bigger company, um, you know, sales enablement, product marketing may have already packaged some of this stuff for you at an industry level, uh, which could be really, really, really helpful. Or if you have account-based marketing functions supporting you, if you are pursuing up market, that organization could also be really, really helpful in crafting your message. So my, my point being, you probably have individuals inside of your business um, that could provide a lot of support and help. Perfect. Now, that, this has been really great to kind of start off at, at the, the earlier stage um, yeah. career folks and some topics that I, I believe are just um, absolutely relevant. And you've, you've definitely layered in, layered in some gems um, for those listening. Uh, something I failed to mention um, about your background is that you have a pretty strong, um, you know, formal education at Penn and then back there again with Wharton for your MBA. Um, I know there are many aspiring up and coming go to market leaders out there. Uh, who you know, grapple with the question around, oh, like, do I go like, you know, beef up my formal education? Am I missing something there? Versus, hey, do I just like stay in industry, get experience, boots on the ground, um, rubber meets the road type of type of, type of experience um, to, to grow my career? What are your what's your perspective on like the trade offs between, you know, as you're aspiring to like grow in your career, leading more into that, you know, formal education versus kind of like staying, you know, in industry or even switching industries if, you, if you're not where you want to be? Yeah, great question. I uh, had an incredible time, you know, at, at Wharton. The connections I made there are 
are incredible. Um, the, the professors, the content of the program, I mean, top notch, and I, and I highly recommend it uh, for folks that are, you know, interested in, in you know, learning and, and growth and, and maybe rounding out kind of that business acumen that we were just talking about earlier. But I do think, and this maybe this is a little controversial, you know, for revenue leaders, um, it's not necessary uh, to go off and to get your MBA in order to climb the ranks in sales. Maybe that'll change. Um, but there's a very clear path, you know, in sales and, and sales leadership that you can progress sheerly through like incredible performance, self-studying on what sales practices and innovative approaches are working today and really intentionally trying to be a modern sales leader. Um, the recommendation I give people that are kind of like weighing this decision is be really thoughtful around the cost um, of that program uh, versus the expected return that you're going to get. And especially if you're taking two years off to do that, because you have to include the earnings opportunity costs, right? There, those are two years and you're not going to be making your salary or your OTE so that you need to factor that into the equation. And you got to realize paying for the program, those are with post tax dollars. So you'd have to earn X, right, in order to be able to, to pay that. And you got to like literally put it put it down on paper, put an Excel spreadsheet and figure out, OK, this is really going to actually cost me X. Like what expected return would I would I get out of this? Um, the value I do think you will get out of a program like that is uh, like signal value, I guess you could say. I mean, just the fact mm -hmm. that you like took the effort to put yourself through additional learning, um, challenging learning, right? Uh, maybe mid-stage in your career, I think signals in general to folks that you care about growth, you care about your professional development. Um, I think the connections, as I mentioned earlier, that you make there can be incredibly valuable in ways that are hard to calculate. Um, you know, sounding boards, people you can just call up, right, to ask for advice or potential partners in business or uh, potential employers even. Uh, all of those connections can be made in the program. Um, Another benefit too, I, I think of going, this is an interesting one. I wasn't expecting this in the program. You actually gain confidence. And what I mean by that is when you're in like an advanced education program, like an MBA, everyone that's in the program is, is pretty awesome um, in like a wide array of disciplines, a wide array of industries, a wide array of backgrounds. And at first you're like, oh my gosh, everyone here is incredible. And it's definitely like imposter syndrome. But then after time, I think you realize like, you bring a very unique set of strengths. You bring a very unique set of experiences they actually don't have. And as a salesperson, being in an MBA program, like revenue is critical to any company, any business that you're talking about. You bring so much value and perspective to your class members and to your classmates. And, and um, yeah, so you kind of gain confidence a little bit. That when you're surrounded yourself by amazing salespeople and sales leaders, and we're all kind of talking the same language and the same thing, it's hard to lose. It's easy to lose sight of that, right? Um, but when you're with incredible people that have other disciplines, uh, you really shine through. So I think it's valuable in, in, that, in that way. And as you mentioned, it's a great thing to do if you want to pivot. If you're not sure if sales or revenue is great for you, go to a program, right? You know, explore uh, other other businesses other functions um and i think you'll figure out if sales is actually where you want to be or maybe if you want to make a pivot yeah no i appreciate uh you laying out not just you know the decision itself but also just the the various factors that people should consider you know such as the cost uh such as your your you know your current company and and the environment there so i i I appreciate your perspectives uh, on that. If somebody comes to the conclusion that, hey, you know what, I want to stick it, you know, stay stay in industry, yeah. um, maybe even in my exact company, uh, what are some of the ways that you uh, have seen um, or experienced that uh, help people level up uh, on the job? Um, in addition to just coming in, punching your you know, your daily clock and clocking out at the end, like what are those extra things that you think uh, help separate people and prep them for that next level in their career outside of kind of like this formal education step that you've kind yeah. of spoken about a little bit? I love that question. Um, I think the most beautiful thing about a career in revenue is that like what works is forever progressing and evolving and changing. Like there are like almost unlimited opportunities to grow and improve your skills and improve your capabilities in revenue. 
Um, and so I think you have to have that mindset, right? Whether it's formal education or not, you always have to be learning and always have to be growing. And so, uh, again, we're, we're lucky. Like if you go on LinkedIn today, there's a ton of like high quality perspective and content out there on a daily basis. Um, so I think one, just finding those thought leaders, um, you know, that exist out there, um, finding, you know, the companies that you think are doing really innovative things, following them and consuming their thought leadership, consuming their research, engaging with those influencers, I think really is an easy way to just build your knowledge of like what modern sales skills are, are working today. Um, of course, there are like a number of incredible books out there on selling best practices, right? Like I absolutely encourage every, anyone that's like very serious about like their career in sales to read the basics, right? Like read the challenger sale, read spin set and selling, read medic, right? Um, these, these are, have lasted the test of time for, for a reason, like expose yourself to those books, take the time and invest in your professional development. And then, uh, the last thing I'd say, and this is like, I think a seller superpower, um, is like manage your manager uh, to develop you. So be relentless with your direct manager around what skill gap, what what capability they think if you could improve a little bit, if you could like turn the dial on, would be a game changer for your performance. Do not wait for them um, to come to you and to provide you with that perspective. Like run to them, be relentless about asking those kind of questions. They're going to be like your most incredible resource to fast cycle your growth and your development. Love that. I think there's a topic there to dig into in a minute. I did want to ask any influencers or people that you think anybody you think that like has really interesting things to say right now, like in the moment yeah. today. Um, <laughs> From like a sales execution perspective, uh, she's a good friend of mine, but shout out Jen Allen. Knuth. She's fantastic. Uh, we worked together back in the day um, at CEB, but she's, she's incredible. Um, from a sales like leadership, like running the sales organization business, particularly at that like scale up phase, um, I think Sam Jacobs who runs Pavilion is fantastic. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I'd get started probably with those two from like sales leadership perspective and more from like frontline execution perspective. Love that. Um, yeah. Another thing you mentioned is one of the exciting things, uh, exciting, terrifying, challenging, all of it, uh, things about being in sales is that it's always changing. What works it, it, what works is, is always shifting and you need to kind of stay on top of trends. What are some of the trends that you and Pluralsight are kind of keeping tabs on? Um, and how do you balance like staying on the front edge of like technology and tactics and approaches uh, versus like ensuring that the teams uh, are, are operating like on the basics. Like you have your, you, know, you have your basic layup, uh, your, your layups are, are like your free throws are there, but like, uh, you know, uh, but the tactics, uh, how, how do you balance between tactics and like fundamentals is kind of, kind of the question. Yeah, absolutely. Um, especially for more mature companies. Um, and I guess even if you're a sales leader, you know, at more of that like scale up phase, um, I think having like a baseline framework for what your sales process is and within that your sales methodology is a critical starting point. I mean, like I, maybe I can elaborate a little bit more on that because those terms sales process, sales methodology get thrown around a lot. But, right. You know, I, you know, I mean, like what are the meeting types that you tend to execute with a customer? What is that buyer journey? Right. Um, what are you trying to accomplish and what is the customer trying to accomplish within each of those different stages across the journey? And then critically, like what does amazing execution of that meeting step look like? Um, if there are visuals being used, what are those visuals? Um, what does the script look and sound like? It doesn't mean you're not gonna obviously make that at your own, but we should have standard for what great looks like. What information, what kind of discovery do we wanna know at this stage in the buying process? And the reason why, like, I think that's so critical is because that's like your chassis, right? That's like your framework. And as you, you're right, as things progress and things innovate, you go back to that and you can make small tweaks and adjustments. Um, the reason why I think that's so critical is it's so easy to get overwhelmed in sales with all of the things that you need to know and be good at, right? It's like, 
Are you effective at discovery? What does your elevator pitch sound like? Are you teeing up your demo correctly with your SC? Are you good at negotiation tactics? Like, it, like I could go on and on with all the things we expect of our sellers. So I do think, at least I need that kind of like model to plug in all of those skills and capabilities into um, in order to have it all make sense to me and hopefully for my, for my sales team. So I think once you have that, then when there's really innovative approaches here, you can re- go back to that model. Like, ah, okay, like we used to do it like this. Like, let's tinker a little bit. Let's do it like this now. And maybe you deploy some kind of training uh, program to support that. So I think that that framework, that foundation um, is is critical. Yeah. Um, you know, as you're talking about the role of the salesperson, you know, it strikes me that, you know, a lot of it kind of starts with, you know, that initial discovery call. Mm-hmm. Um, but with, you know, this isn't 2021 anymore. A lot of companies are dealing with, you know, the realities of relatively difficult uh, economic conditions, uphill yep. battles to hit targets, all of these things. One, are you seeing any of this like consolidation happening um, either at Pluralsight or elsewhere? Um, and then two, uh, what would you what would be your best advice to to like reps who find themselves in situations where they've got to like stretch and like do things that they haven't done maybe in years, like a cold calling a prospect or like how, what would your be your um, uh, advice to, to, to folks to find themselves in this situation that frankly is, is reality for, for a good number of folks out there? Yeah. I mean, I mean, you're spot on with your assessment. I think it's kind of common knowledge now, but over the last few years, it's been a little tough for SAS. Uh, you know, I think there's been a few things, obviously, like rising interest rates, you know, put a lot of debt pressure on companies uh, with higher interest rates, um, like a, a focus from uh, valuations based on revenue to valuations based on, on EBITDA, putting more pressure on the cost component of the equation there. Um, you know, this consolidation, you know, in kind of the revenue tech stack place or like I think the tech in general. Um, where we've seen, you know, an explosion of, you know, SaaS platforms and um, companies recognizing that, wow, you know, maybe we have too many. And um, because we have too many, we aren't getting the returns that we expected. And so companies are looking to consolidate. And so that's putting pressure on demand that we see out there in the market. Um, so, yeah, all of these things have, I think, forced a lot of companies to like take a step back you know, reflect on their tech stack, reflect on their sales and marketing costs, and then therefore like the structure um, of, of their business. And it's been a painful time period, I know, for a lot of organizations. Um, you know, as a seller, that's like living in this environment, right? Um, yeah, I think, you know, you got to uh, go back to your individual business, um, what do you need to accomplish this year and uh, accountability, right? Like figure out how to own your outcomes. Um, and if you're not seeing uh, the leads that maybe you once saw from marketing or maybe your BD is struggling a little bit more or your SCR struggling a little bit more, right, to get meetings um, with that additional capacity that you have as a salesperson, I think you need to focus on self-generating business. Um, and the reality is we were talking about business acumen earlier. Um, as an AE, you likely have business acumen, right, that others in your organization do not have that equips you to engage those bigger accounts in your territory or the more senior executives on your prospect list in a more tailored, authentic way that then maybe marketing or BD can't quite do yet. And yeah. so, yeah, with that additional capacity that you have on your calendar, um, yeah, go, <laughs> I'll go all in on pipe gen. Um, And there's one other just tangent thought there, like the way I I like to think about like a role of an account executive is capacity. It's like your calendar, right? Your time spend. That's how you spend your time is the name of the game. And so if you're sitting there with only, you know, five customer facing meetings in a given week, um, yeah, that's probably a problem. And you better figure out a way to use that blank space, you know, to generate pipeline, to change that. And like, again, that's what I mean by accountability. So, so something that uh, you know, we've talked about career progression, we talked about career, kind of some career choices, um, mm-hmm. and most recently just discussing like the current environment and how people need to uh, think about um, and kind of expanding on their own role uh, right now to to fill a their you know, a business need. Um, something that is critical to career 
you know, progression is just, you know, the outcomes that you produce, right? And those outcomes are to some extent, uh, or to a large extent, driven by like the decisions you make. Um, and those decisions really like you, you, you've got qualitative and quantitative data that you, you need to be consuming all of the time. I'd love to hear a little bit about how you think about running, like the important elements of running a data-driven go-to-market organization function, even down to that team or individual business level. I'd just like love to hear kind of like just your general thesis on running a, a, a data-driven go-to-market org, yeah. and then like we'll we'll like t- take it from there and see where we go, see where it goes. Talking uh, data-driven revenue organization, that's my that's my love language right there. Um, <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, uh, yeah, I'm a bit, bit of a data geek. I, I love analytics. Uh, those that work with me know that all too well. Um, uh, and again, uh, it has to be said, the caveat, like data isn't everything. You know, absolutely. Uh, it can point you in the right direction and then you can expect qualitatively. But but having that data, I think, is absolutely critical. Um, so from like a sales leadership perspective and like leading a revenue organization with data, um, the way I think about it is... Um, you have an ultimate target, right? Like as any kind of revenue leader, it may be a bookings target, um, but it may be something different. It may be a renewal target. Um, maybe the target is um, achieving a series B, right? But like there's some ultimate business target that you likely have. And so what is kind of the key metric, right? That you need to focus on, right? It's probably a bookings target, right? That relates to that goal or that outcome. Um, and then there are leading indicator metrics, that sit below, at least that's how I think about that, sit below that ultimate metric. Um, I think it's really critical to get those component metrics right. Like what are the the metrics that if we achieve each of these, um, we will achieve that ultimate goal. And you can drill down even deeper, I'd say, but I call that second layer like the metrics that matter. Um, And I think being really clear around what those metrics are uh, with your team members as well as with partners um, across the business um, is super, super important. Um, uh, there's a you know, saying like, uh, you can't manage what you don't measure, um, but don't measure uh, what you're not planning on managing. Uh, mm. And, and, I, and I, I like that a lot because I also think folks can go to the other end of the spectrum and just get totally overwhelmed right, with data points and with dashboards. And so, again, I think it sp- speaks to this discipline of having that metric hierarchy that kind of hangs together. That's really critical. Um, the other advice I'd give on, like, thinking about how to set up your data model um, in a revenue organization is there's almost like a beautiful linearity with uh, revenue metrics. Um, you can think of, like, winning by design's bow tie model, mm. but they, they flow together. Um, and I think it's critical that you understand how your activities are impacting your pipeline generation, right? Um, your right. pipeline generation to your pipeline metrics. Um, there's a lot you can think about just within your pipeline, conversion rates, time and stage, um, attribution of your source attribution of your pipeline, right? And then there's outcome metrics, right? Um, there's closed one, there's closed lost, there's pushed deals, and then you're getting into your current customer metrics, right? Your onboarding rates, your adoption rates, and then your growth metrics, et cetera, right? Um, I think having a handle on um, maybe by business unit, by by segment, um, understanding your data model that underpins uh, your revenue organization, understanding that linearity, both what conversion rates exist and what your targets are, as well as the volume, um, sometimes in terms of count and dollar value throughout that model, is important. And I think that's something that even as a startup, right, or like scale up, like you can start to wrap your arms around that. Um, it's something you should do. So then when you do those really innovative uh, tactics, um, you actually have that model in place to understand the impact of those changes. And you can make quick uh, data informed decisions uh, more effectively. No, I uh, love that framing. And in terms of just kind of your your all in metric and then your input metrics uh, that you, you you have to get right. What does getting it wrong mean in this? Yeah, in this context? there's so many ways to get it wrong. Um, mm-hmm. you know, some of the some of the ways that I've seen it is I think the most common issues that I see are more like um, you can almost think of it as like point dashboards. Like we have Mm. this dashboard that looks at this outcome. We have this dashboard that looks at this outcome. We have marketing over here and they look at marketing performance in this way. And I think that's a symptom of like 
each a business unit or each uh, organization or each function like reporting on their own performance and their own success and losing sight of that like more holistic model. Um, that's probably the most common issue uh, that we see because without understanding how each of these parts connect and flow together, it's really hard to make decisions and, and meet, uh, make changes that are that are going to be effective. And also just like politically, it kind of turns into just like each function trying to pick the best, <laughs> you know, metrics <laughs> that, you know, um, you know, represent their organization the best. And then it just, you know, that can create like finger pointing and stuff. So. Oh yeah. Uh, not, not to mention that like when you create a metric and you measure it in isolation of everything else, it's very easy to gain your one metric at the expense yeah. of other metrics that you're conveniently leaving off the table. Right. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, another mistake I've seen made is not including like time as an access. So sometimes we look at data points um, like in isolation. This week we did X, this month we did Y, right? And I, like that doesn't mean much unless you have context, right? Which is which is the past um, as well as targets. And so uh, whenever we look at um, dashboards and reporting and, and analytics, um, I wanna make sure that I'm seeing um, those data points relative to previous points in time to identify trends. You'd mentioned, made a, a slight reference to um, needing to see, like, this is, this, getting your data model right, setting up your proper metrics, all of that um, is really critical in order for you to understand, like, whether the, like, tactical things you are doing and the experiments you're running, um, the plays you're putting together are having the impact that, that, that you know, you want to have, uh, see them create. What are some of the, like, interesting plays that you, your team's, um, you, you've heard from your teams that are, are, are considering um, what are they considering in terms of uh, experiments or things that they're trying to do to uh, drive these metrics we've been talking about for the last three or four minutes? Yeah, I, I mean, I'll, I'll share one we just launched. I don't know how relevant it'll be to, to other organizations, um, but let's start with use cases, OK, or with customer use cases, customers that are using our solution in a really powerful, high ROI way. Um, we have a particularly in, a particular industry vertical um, that uh, can leverage Plural Sites platform in a super unique way, given the nature of their business, um, mm -hmm. to realize, like I said, a, a ton of value, a ton of ROI. And so, I think being able to identify those customer use cases, that like core value right up front, is is really really important and is ripe for sales plays. So then we take that really nuanced understanding of the specific industry mm. vertical and how they're realizing value, like literally like calling up customers in that like active customers and hearing, getting their language, talking to, we're a larger company, so talking to internal folks that maybe came from that industry to make sure we're understanding how the problem manifests, mm. how the pain manifests and why our solution is so effective at solving those pains. Um, mm -hmm. And we turn that into not just a, but I'll kind of walk through it nuts to bolts. Um, you know, we worked with our revenue strategy and operations team to identify the, the addressable market of that industry vertical. Um, we worked with our BD team to, you know, leverage Sales Navigator to pull uh, prospect lists from uh, for executives and titles from those target accounts. And they were actually interesting titles that you normally we wouldn't pursue, but was relevant for this play, um, right? We designed for the sales organization, the outbound messaging, um, mm -hmm. tailored designed to resonate with that. We did a blitz day, right? Focused on like pursuing this particular segment. And, but we didn't stop there. We didn't just stop with then getting the meetings, right? We mm -hmm. then worked with sales enablement to make sure we actually tailored our pitch deck and our, and our, and our storyline to be hyper resonant, right? To use their language with that customer base. We had tailored discovery questions for that industry in those use cases. And then our pre-sales team even got on board and um, built like a custom demo, speaking to the specific use cases, using the specific pain points, the specific language. And then from a proposal perspective, we got agreement on tweaking some of our terms and conditions that we know are just critical for this particular use case that Nori would be. So it's kind of like this nuts to bolts, you know, mm, program. It yeah. ain't just like, oh, this industry likes us. Like, let's design a cool email cadence, right? And like lock and loaded, right? I think we treated it as a form. We generated like 
in one quarter for us it was it was a big deal like 1.5 million in just net new acquisition pipelines mm. our largest deals actually our largest deals um, are coming from that industry segment now so it's been pretty successful yeah I, I really really awesome to just hear you walk through that entire you know, nuts to bolts uh, as you put it play yeah. to what extent did you lean on hard data and to what extent was this like intuition um input from conversations you've had like you know, clearing calls, whatever. Like, I'm just curious how you came to the conclusion that, yes, this is the thing we're going to invest significant resources in. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, yeah, because like every time you do that, there's trade-offs, obviously. Totally. Yeah. Um, a, the answer is a brilliant customer, right? Like we had one or two customers in this space uh, by listening to the call recordings, hear the customer talking about their particular use case. Um, you know, we, we work hard to really understand the business objectives of our customers, um, what initiatives they have in place to achieve those objectives, what metrics they're using to measure the success of their initiative, right? And through that rich, like, discovery process, um, you know, I think we understand, like, wow, this, what a cool way, like, to use, to use our platform. Um, and after that, it was honestly just saying, like, having some internal conversations and realizing that market is huge. And that market is actually an untapped industry vertical that you wouldn't naturally think of. Um, it's definitely been undervalued. So it was really just through the conviction of that cost, that brilliant customer using it in that way. The lift actually, I know I rambled a bit, but the lift wasn't actually that. Mm. Big. So, you know, I mean, um, this wasn't a plural site wide initiative. It was just for really my acquisition team. And, and it's expanded since then. Um, you know, we had a, an analyst, you know, pull the list of accounts, you know, our BD frontline BD manager, like took a crack at, at writing, you know, the script. Um, I sat there with the sales manager on my team and enablement. And we like, you know, tweaked the deck and, you know, uh, made it look pretty, you know, I delivered, you know, the training to my team to make sure like we were getting the positioning right and like, scheduled the blitz day, you know, like mm -hmm. just a handful of us putting it, putting it all together. So I wouldn't be, my point is I wouldn't be deterred, um, uh, to, you know, execute that nuts to bolts process if you're a you know, smaller business or have limited resources. Got it. <clears throat> no, I appreciate uh, you sharing that. It's just f fun to hear uh, what you are, are doing to kind of drive these metrics uh, for your business. Yeah. Um, one uh, thing I go ahead. Uh, yeah. One thing I just add there, I do think it ties back to that idea around like breaking through, you know, in a challenging pipeline generation environment here, like, being authentic, you know, doing your mm. research, like this is a way, right, to balance like true thoughtful resonance, you know, like research, like thoughtfulness about that specific kind of company's business and what they do and how these organizations go to market and what they need and the challenges they're facing at scale, you know, which I, you know, is what everyone's trying to, to achieve is like resonance at scale. And this was, I think, a, a good way of, of doing that. Man, there have been so many good nuggets uh, during our conversation today. Uh -huh. Uh, I want to give you a chance to share with the the audience, uh, you know, where they can find you on, you know, on, on socials or elsewhere. How do the people reach you? And then what are your tips for those out there listening um, for kind of growing their careers and advancing quickly? Yeah, feel free to reach out on LinkedIn. It's just Michael Sharp at Pluralsight uh, based in San Diego. Um, and feel free to reach out, too, if you have any questions around anything I covered. If you're kicking around that MBA idea and want a sounding board, I'm, I'm happy to be of help there. Um, in terms of advice, I guess I'll, I'll leave folks with two bits of advice, um, one for maybe the earlier stage salesperson and then one for like an aspiring leader. Um, for the earlier stage salesperson, I'd say um, don't be afraid of like your weaknesses or your gaps uh, in your uh, sales process or in your sales capabilities. In fact, I'd say uh, run after those gaps. Um, so when um, the best salespeople I've seen have been obsessed with knowing after a sales meeting with their manager, like, what could I have done better? Uh, it's nice to hear the good things, but like the good things don't actually help you up your game the next time. And like I said earlier in the call, there's maniacal about understanding uh, what is the one thing I could be doing better right now to improve my outcomes. I think that mindset is just 
incredibly valuable. And it turns like things that could be scary, right? Like I messed that up or I didn't do that great or I suck at this into like opportunities. Like that's that's the value, right? That, that they want to get. And I think that's, the, like I said earlier, an incredible mindset. Um, and then for sales leaders, um, aspiring sales leaders, what I'd say is um, try to like learn a lot and develop conviction around a vision for how you want uh, your sales team, your sales organization to operate. I think the best leaders that I've interviewed have this clarity around, if I was in that role, here's exactly how I would run that business. And it doesn't mean you have to have done that job before. It could be based on things you've observed others do that uh, you would want to replicate. It could be things, as I mentioned earlier, that you're exposing yourself to online or through books. But I want to hear that you have like a crystal clear vision for how you would do the job uh, that you're pursuing prior to uh, getting that job. Um, Because then I'm excited to hand over the keys. I'm like, that sounds amazing. Like, have at it. And I'm here to support you and help you like mold that, like that, that vision into reality. But uh, always have uh, be working towards building that vision. Michael, thank you so much for your time today. And uh, those last two pieces of advice, um, both for the practitioners uh, that are you know, early stage, as well as those um, early, early stage leaders who are, are gonna, looking to take that next step. Um, awesome, awesome advice. Um, listeners, uh, take them up on it. Uh, Michael, it has been good to talk with you today. And uh, that's a wrap for Go to Market Mavericks. Awesome. Thanks, Matson. My pleasure.